Well, thank you, Marty. Greatly appreciate it. Great to be talking with everybody again. Sorry I can't be there today like I was yesterday. We had a great conversation yesterday on manager selection that Peter also participated in that conversation with us. So I'm looking forward to continuing our, our discussion with him today. This time about uh, you know direct investments, family office direct investments. Uh, you heard Marty, he, he said that, you know, two of the things we're going to talk about here, and we certainly will touch on them, time horizon, and, um, and, uh, <laughs> and time horizons and targets for returns, so we'll certainly touch on that. Uh, we'll also discuss, you know, active and passive investing that as indirect from family offices. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, the differences between generations and how that impacts things. Uh, we'll discuss, you know, areas that you're, you're currently bullish on and, and not bullish on. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, you know, diligence and what needs to be done. It seems like even in Daniel's uh, discussion here just a few minutes ago, the, 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 the old, and I believe, Peter, yesterday we had this conversation about the old-fashioned way of diligencing. It even fits in in the crypto world. If you're going to be investing in companies and 3.0 web companies and blockchain companies, that, that diligence piece is still there. Uh, so first off, let me introduce our, our panel. We have Peter Plout of uh, Plout Advisory. We have uh, Guara uh, Panthakar, uh, an OCIO of Bloomberg. I hope I didn't do that too badly there, Guarv. Close, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> and Steven Stoltzstein, CEO of Force Family Office. My name is Mark Heil. I'm with Pacific Premier Trust. I won't go through my background again, but I will do my disclaimer just to keep my lawyers very happy. Uh, information presented here is for educational purposes only and is not intended as and may not be relied upon as tax, legal, or investment or other advice. Pacific Premier Trust performs the duties of a custodian. We do not evaluate, recommend, or endorse any particular investment opportunities. You are advised to consult with your professional advisors for specific guidance regarding your investments. Uh, investments are not FDIC insured or subject to risk, including the loss of risk principle. And finally, I'll throw in that, you know, I may express opinion here. That opinion may or may not align with the banks or the trust company. So I'm speaking for myself on this panel. Uh, so for the next 40, 45 minutes, we're going to be having a conversation and it will be a conversation up front. I, I hope we get the interaction that we had yesterday uh, with, with both the manager selection panel and then again with the healthcare panel so that we had a little bit later. So with that, I, I'd like to have Peter, if you don't mind. Uh, introduce yourself and uh, give a little background on Plot Advisor. Thanks, Mark. And um, please send me that background because I really want that. Yeah, it looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sitting in front of a window or is that fake? No, no, it was, uh, I believe it was on top of a building. It was one of those towers uh, when I took what this photo. What about the guy speaking? Is that fake or is that real? <laughs> uh, it's totally fake. It's a bot. I thought so. <laughs> you know, we're talking about Web 3.0, so I just want to know if it was a bot or not. But, uh, no, thanks, guys. Uh, it's an honor to be here again today, and I appreciate Marty and um, having me come on board. Um, so I've been in the investing space for 30 years, buy side, sell side, top investment banks and uh, hedge funds, etc. cetera. Uh, for the last 10 years, um, half of that's been uh, focused on a... Uh, uh, five family multi billion dollar multi family office where we focused on direct investments, real estate space, metals and mining, infrastructure, um, etc. And uh, the other half, I've been spending uh, my time uh, basically advising family offices on manager selection allocation, in particular with the private credit spin, because I, my background is distressed in credit, not equity. Um, the second thing has been raising capital. Uh, for funds, whether uh, small or large, particularly in the private equity and credit space, um, as well as some companies. Um, and then three um, has really been um, away from capital raising has been origination doing the research um, on deals um, with a heavy, heavy focus on, um, as Mark mentioned, uh, due diligence, due diligence and due diligence. So uh, uh, and that includes impact and that includes ESG all within that, that tool set. So. Looking forward to having a really, you know, nice conversive, 
conversation around that. And hopefully, you know, just like the last panel, we have a little uh, back and forth and maybe a little debate from time to time during this panel. That'd be fun to see. Um, Gaurav, why don't you take us through and, and tell us your, your role as an, out, as an OCIO for uh, uh, Bloomberg? Sure, Mark, thanks a lot. And um, great to be here with both of you. Um, so let me first uh, very quickly give my disclosures as well. So anything that I say here is, is not investment advice and all the views are my own. The Bloomberg Corporation may or may not uh, be on the same page on these views. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, in terms of my background over the last 23 years, I've uh, started my career in private equity in venture source deals, structured deals, uh, worked at uh, various investment banks, hedge funds, uh, was at a pension plan, uh, thereafter was a CIO of a family office, and a couple of the things I'm going to talk about today. Uh, you know, we did direct investing, particularly focused on the fintech niche there. And at Bloomberg, my focus is on alternative investments, working with some of the smaller family office and endowment and uh, foundation clients in terms of helping them sharpen uh, their asset allocation to alternatives, uh, the, the focus on co-invest, directs, and really help them underwrite things. Again, not offer any advice, but help them be better at what they do. So that's kind of what we do for a living and uh, work with various clients uh, across the world um, on, on some of these topics. Great. Thank you. Steven, you're queued up. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, hi, I'm Steve Saltstein, CEO of Force Family Office. Um, I started in the family space uh, in the mid 90s, where I sourced, structured, negotiated, and closed uh, about a billion dollars in transactions for a family office uh, in the Middle East. And then uh, off the back of that, built a track record and launched a fund. So I ran a fund for about a decade that did uh, direct investing, secured lending, and some convertible art. And then, you know, in 2012, was sitting around with some friends and we were trying to figure out, you know, where is the next great pool of flexible allocation going to come from? And I thought, well, I'd worked for a family office. You know, I think it's going to come from there. I know where a lot of those folks are. And so, uh, you know, we've built the largest network of investment seeking family offices in the U S and basically what we do is bring our families together to share intellectual capital, best practices, meet best in class service providers. But, but ultimately what we do, is we bring them together in the context of co-investing uh, and then hopefully bring world-class investment opportunities. So. Fantastic. Since yeah. I'm not there in person today, I'm going to ask the three of you to be my eyes and ears. If you see somebody who has a, wants to make a comment or wants to join in, feel free to invite them in and, uh, you know, uh, make, make, make it possible for them. So, Peter, I'm going to start with you. Yesterday, we spoke about manager selection and we, we sort of made the case for why managers should be used. Uh, make the 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 uh, the case today for why they should do direct deals. So first of all, I'm looking at it from a family office strictly perspective, and right. um, the most important thing is and we talked about this yesterday, Mark. Was do you have the resources? And I'm not talking about capital. I'm talking human capital to effectively analyze, research, underwrite a private transaction. This is not a public company. Um, for the most part, that has uh, uh, regularly available financial information, quarterly earnings calls, et cetera. And, there, and for the most part, may not have, and most likely does not have, uh, followed by the sell side. Whether you agree with the sell side or not, at least get some industry overview. So number one is basically, do you have the staff, research staff, to analyze any particular private transaction? Do you have the staff that has the industry expertise, let alone the company expertise, to effectively do that. If not, then we talk about going out to an asset um, manager. Um, and then it's simply an evaluation of which asset manager has the experience in the particular industry space that you're looking at. And when I'm talking about industry experience, not just investing in a company, but might have a private credit and a private equity arm <coughs> so that they can leverage the operating partners within the particular space. So if you have that, and that's usually driven by CEOs of companies that they acquired, um, you're more likely to be successful in that. So um, if you have the ability to, to use experts in that field and do the asset selection through the manager space, but I am uh, against the whole feeder fund thing that we spoke about. Why well, have a feeder fund that just adds more and more fees on top of fees? Um, that's now how I play it. So if you have the team and you don't need to, I'm not talking about it has to be MSD capital with a hundred research channels, just enough experience that you can analyze a company in a particular industry because 
when uh, the economy slows down, I'm not talking about going into a depression or significant recession, and interest expense becomes pretty high as a portion of your revenues, you want to make sure if things get difficult, you'll be able to work with the management team there and help go through that crisis rather than dealing with Hulahan Loki or FTI or some of the other um, distressed advisors when your company all of a sudden um, you know, is being restructured. So that's my comment there. Talk a little bit about uh, the trend I guess I've been seeing at family offices is to bring in captive managers. I'll, I'll call them captive managers, but where they go out and hire private equity professionals to run their portfolio for them, make the directs. And it, an offshoot of that, of course, is Gaurav, what you know, it being an OCIO. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that trend and, and whether that's good and how that works and uh, particularly in multifamily situations, multifamily offices, you see that uh, uh, a little bit more. So chat with us about that. Yeah, no, Mark, that's a that's a great point. I mean, as Peter said, I mean, do you really need the entire industrial machinery to, to research everything under the sun, including the sun, and really, you know, barnstorm something? Perhaps not. I think the key thing, I want to take a few steps back, and when we, you know, work with several family offices, or help them either re-underwrite or think about direct investing, you know, a couple of things that I ask them is, okay, I mean, is there an alignment of a team? Is that a team that you care about? So why do you really care about it? What is your vertical expertise or your network expertise in that particular team? Is there an operator that you know or have access to that's, you know, a better access than anybody anybody else? And then you really understand the regulatory ecosystem or just the broad ecosystem better than others. So to make it, uh, you know, kind of really exemplify this, you know, back when I was at the family office the CIO, um, you know, I can't name names, but, you know, a couple of the families involved were some of the most prominent hedge fund managers out of London. It's their private money. And we rightly so thought that our expertise in financial services, particularly in fintech, and we wanted to focus on fintech in emerging markets. Great team, exciting. But then how do you really go and implement? So we looked at a variety of different managers. Uh, we never really thought that there was any good peer play exposure. Um, there was a Good pushback from the principals, rightly so, that you know they just collect the two percent on commitment, but we're not really going to get the juice of the opportunity. Okay, so then let's go do something ourselves. Um, easier said than done. It happened to be uh, then kind of really going and underwriting an opportunity within the fintech space in India, which we thought we understood a little bit better than other people. Uh, while you know we thought so, and I think we did a half decent job. I think it was the first direct investment and a tremendous amount of learning in terms of, uh, you know, one of my biggest learnings was putting together the right advisory board. I mean, if I had to redo this again, I could have saved a, a couple of years and, um, you know, some heartache uh, by putting the right advisory board together on day one, which we did on our second deal. But, uh, you know, kind of really augmenting that expertise. So when you say, if you don't have all the expertise in house, and it's not just uh, the subject matter in, in, in a particular sector, it's about, okay, fintech. Finance, fine, it's narrow enough. But then, what about the regulation? Uh, you know, what about the, the the legal stuff around it? What about the, the the pipeline of collecting loans from somewhere? I mean, there is a lot of different expertise that needs to be brought in. What about the technology connect back to the valley? I mean, do you have an advisor who really has expertise? Uh, you know, to kind of connect globally. So all of those things were very, very good learning. So I think that's been one of my biggest learnings: is how do you kind of you know go with the right machinery, narrow it the opportunity enough to get it. Yeah, we'll, we'll probe a little bit deeper about, you know, the technologies family offices need to have, particularly when you're dealing with all the different factions of the family and investments that you have, and sometimes the complicated cap tables that you have on these investments. But right now I want to shoot over to Steve and ask Steve to, you know, first off, talk of, you know, we had our, our introductory call. You spoke about you, you deal with 800 family offices. And you have a database of 8,000. Uh, and the economy is, you know, currently going through some significant changes right now. So what are you hearing from your collective uh, group that you deal with in terms of where they're bearish and where they're bullish, uh, you know, both from a, a strategy viewpoint, maybe a domain viewpoint and geography, if you would. You know, before I go there, I just want to go back to the previous question, which is, you know, if I look at our database and if I look at our 800 relationships, I'd be willing to bet that a third, maybe 40% of them, I could name five multi-billion dollar family offices just here in New York City, where the patriarch or the matriarch, one person 
is making the investment decision and they don't rely on a team and they feel like, you know, they have um, been through battles. They have been successful. They know the formula for what makes a successful investment, be it the management team or, you know, the right industry at the right time. Or, you know, I, I know family offices right now that are really hoping for a recession because they've said to me, we've made our most money. Uh, when we can get involved in distressed companies during a recession. And so, you know, I guess the old adage, you've met one family office, you've met one family office, but I just don't think you need to have full team. I, I believe me, I work with, you know, families that have a ton of analysts, but I don't think that that one formula necessarily means you're going to make uh, a successful investor. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think, you know, that's the difference between a first generation family office, second generation and a third family, third generation of family office too. Uh, those, you know, those who earned the money, made the money, really uh, uh, can get in there and they have those operation skills and those instincts of how to look at a company and say, okay, this one's going to be successful, that one's not. But that doesn't necessarily translate to the next couple generations. Um, so it's, a, it's an excellent point you made. Um, but in if you don't mind, what people are bullish about, or, or you know, that's uh, why I was going to ask you to move on to that yeah. area if you would. And Norris, uh, you know, I think people are um, generally in a holding pattern, generally in real estate. There's probably 20% of the real estate market in regards to subsector that's attractive right now. And, you know, the rest is uh, <laughs> wait and see. Um, there's, uh, you know, there, there's always uh, an opportunity somewhere in regards to sectors. Our families are uh, keenly interested in healthcare uh, as technology relates to healthcare, the advancements there. I think people are really starting to um, look at precious metals again. Uh, you know, I'm going up to PDAC in March, which is the largest gold and precious metals conference. And um, it, we're gonna be in a room with about a hundred family offices. And it's funny about precious metals. It's like people really just wanna relearn. They want to learn how to relearn how to invest in that sector because they think it could be a good place to be in the coming decade. Um, yeah, sir. Could, uh, just to add to that point, Steve, I, mean, I think you make a great point on health tech. So out of the 35 family offices, just to kind of put some numbers here, 35 family offices, mainly single family offices, sub $2 billion that we most recently did some work with, uh, about 17 of them are in, very interested in health tech. I mean, they're kind of thinking, how do they take advantage of the tech, right? Like, how, how do we do it? I mean, the pondering around it, they're not happy with the pricing that they're getting on the deals so far, but they are, they want to be alert and ready. Mark, we have two questions. A question so, sure. Hi, name is Steve McCarthy. We're in a group here in New York called Gotham Triangle, 75 family offices, principals only, we four times a year, and we don't do direct investing calls deliberately for that purpose. Uh, I've seen too many guys that are part of Tiger 21 where they're in each other's pockets because they do country club investing, okay? Uh, and that's a disaster. In many cases. So how do you deal with your effective role as an outsourced CIO for these families and how are you compensated? So that's a great question. I'll start with that. How are you compensated? That question really came up and I was just, you know, I was a relatively small family office. I was just under a billion back then. And I, you know, one of the first things that the principal said when we were thinking of this fintech and fintech team in an emerging country was, okay, you need to have skin in the game. I'm like, so you have kind of going to tie the poor little CIO's compensation to, but that was the only way right. this was going to happen. Uh, and it's it's not easy, but it was uh, the right thing to do. And in, in that way, you know, we're fully invested in it. We aligned the operating group to the same equity. We're all aligned to the success uh, or lack thereof in the, in the same deal, the same company, in the same way. We took a board seat, which has a lot of regulatory, um, you know, burden and, and other things, which is great from a governance and hygiene standpoint. So, so yeah, so that is definitely, you know, one thing that one needs to get comfortable with. And uh, especially in larger family offices that I've seen here now, taking my step back and now as an OCIO, when I see other people in my previous seat, uh, you know, one of the challenges is as the family offices get larger, the alignment to direct deal, I mean, it's very small. I mean, if it's just a 1% in a broad scheme of things, does the CIO really care? Is he or she? Doesn't move the dial. Doesn't move the dial. But you need somebody to focus on direct deals. So that's the good conundrum, right? Correct. You do. I mean, there's opportunity if it's scoped the right way. Just to answer Do we have a question, second Andy. question? Well, you we'll guys, two this. more guys to answer the first. So sometimes we get buy side assignments. Sometimes we get sell side assignments. 
So, uh, you know, right now, for instance, we have a family office that came to us. They want to allocate to uh, AI into the chat GPT arena. Okay. And they asked us to kind of, you know, look at that whole arena and, um, you know, give them uh, insights into where within uh, that opportunity, perhaps they, they should be delving into. And so, you know, we're really interested in uh, the financial side of that, right? Financial interpretation and how that can really speed, I don't know, something as simple as just uh, understanding spreadsheets, right? I mean, I could spend an hour looking at a spreadsheet or the AI could tell me, you know, here's a spreadsheet and I ask them where the, the margin sensitivities are, et cetera. So we're looking at about 750 companies in that area and, you know, hopefully go back to them with so about you're 20. You're dealing with 35 families at Bloomberg, you're dealing with 800? We well, we have 800 relationships and 8,000 families in our database. Okay, and how many of those types of transactions you just described you do a year? It depends. We also get sell side assignments. So, um, yeah, it, it, it depends. I would say on average at any one time we're working on 15. And do you take two and 20 or what's your compensation? No, no, flat fee. I'm always a flat Oh, okay. Just want to make sure. You? So, again, I'm an advisor, right? So uh, I'll have two things. I'll either have a company that's looking for capital, uh, be paid uh, you know, 1% on debt, 50 base points on debt, 2 or 3% on equity mm -hmm. that's brought in. Um, and that would come from the family office, could be a credit fund, pension fund, sure. et cetera. Uh, so that's a very simple uh, set, segment. Um, for a family office to come to me, they might come to me asking, can you help me out with manager selection? I've got the frequent databases, et cetera, but I can't make any sense with that. So I'll do some type of retained uh, thing for that. If they come out and say, we're looking for a specific thing in the med tech, green tech, clean tech, or a real estate company, in many cases, the family office will not pay me. The company that I find that's looking for capital that will pay me 8%. So the finders. And so there's no two, it's a finder's fee, no two. Got it. Enough. Okay. Is there room in the market for something, how can I characterize it, as a much more or elevated and glorified version of Alka, which um, you know offers um, opportunities to investors. They have a, it's, they're a crowdfunding group that has a minimum of 10 grand to distinguish them from Start Engine and all that or stuff at 500 or whatever. Perfect. So, so you, know, you could raise the minimum to say 50 grand or 100 grand, and then that, that, that site, is a uh, informative, it has not only presents deals that have been analyzed and the analysis can be placed um, in those categories, but it could also assemble its uh, membership in terms Is that effectively crowdfunding? Hmm? Is that effectively crowdfunding? And what about the credit investors? Sorry? Is it crowdfunding? And what about credit investors that have to be involved with this stuff? It's, it's, I mean, so it's, no, it's, it's family office crowd. Rather than, At ten thousand a pop. Yeah, so you, no, no, no. I would say you raise the minimum to hundred thousand. If I may take a stab at this, I mean, these numbers could be anything, but there, there have been an effort like that. A reasonably but successful. But you also effort. do education. You do analysis. You know, it, it becomes a, a so that people are not people can see a gamut of opportunities. So it's like a competence build around certain things, and you get a few people around it, right? I mean that. I mean, there have been many fits and stuff. I mean, in my days as a CEO of a family office, I mean, we always try to work with others and, and we are like seven friends with Gazillion Bell. It not, doesn't always work out like that, most, most of you guys would know. Mm -hmm. But in Europe, uh, I have a few clients and there's a very concerted uh, effort to build, build some domain expertise around certain things. So there's a couple of family offices. It's not just family offices, it's uh, some of the larger pensions who can't really get directly involved in smaller deals, but they haven't progressed enough to work with these family offices and get a big ballast of AUM if and when needed to really get to the right deal sizes, which these people couldn't do by themselves. So I think there have been these groupings. I have only seen more of the informal kind of the stuff. I haven't really come across many formal efforts to put it because the moment you start putting it in the formal effort, it becomes more like a fund or a managed account or a advisory solution. Sorry. I don't know if you guys... I, I'll tell you that there are dozens of family office deal networks online yeah. and they do yeah. due diligence and they're just, they're just out there right now and they do due diligence. There's a lot of them and there's a lot of deal networks online as well that do due diligence. But are they, you know? are they more like private networks or they're really open, open? Some of them are broker dealers. Some of them are private networks. I mean, somebody came to me and said, hey, I got a broker dealer. We're doing private deals. 
great. How many deals you got? 20. That's not a lot of deals. So I told him. Going for Steve's, <laughs> Steve's group, I, I, I get communication from Steve. Sure. And, and I get it through email. Here's an opportunity, and that's great. I mean, I'm in his 8,000 names. What I'm saying is something that's more... You know, I think you're going to find what you're looking for more in these, um, the, the te Telegram, WhatsApp. That's where I'm seeing these, these real groups that are really having true due diligence conversations and evaluating deals um, in these, in these um, you know, chat, chat group, chat networks. That's where I'm seeing it. Right, yeah. So there's A lot of the well. heavy hitters are there. Signal. Yeah. The problem with the online... Uh, uh, marketplaces is that there's not a lot of viewership, right? People need to get a signal that says that that says there's a deal that you want to look at. So it's hard to get to that kind of scale, right? So John, one of the examples I have is Ford. Ford is a group started by Fidelity. There's 50 of us around the country. We're ambassadors. We have 1,300 families involved across different areas. One is a deal silo. They look at high quality deals. There's about 50 or 60 families involved in that. Happy to put you in touch with us. Well, uh, take a look at Alcar. They sometimes have good deals. They actually Alcar does both deals. They also do institutional type deals too. You right. envision you already go into some firms that have all those. Good way to do it. Yeah, as Marty said, there's a ton of these things that are out there. Uh, so what I want to do is is move on to the questions that Marty had asked up front. So we identified so far. We have AI, distressed, healthcare technology, precious metals as areas that uh, family offices currently have some, some interest in. We have a hold on real estate right now, according to Steve. Um, but let's go back to the initial question, Marty, you'd asked when we began this. So what is, when you're thinking about these investments, and we all know that you know the, the advantage of family offices, they have the luxury of time, they're not under pressure to get out. Um, so what is the time horizon when you're thinking about these deals? I mean, it depends on the family. It depends, depends on the on family. The... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, listen, if you're, if you're dealing with a family that's, that has a generational mindset and they are, you know, very focused on handing the assets down to, uh, you know, the next generation and the grandkids and so on. And they consider themselves to be stewards of, you know, the financial estate, uh, if you will then they have a completely different uh, investment style uh, than someone who, a family that's more transaction oriented. And, I, and by the way, that doesn't go by AUM. I, I recently had a conversation with arguably the largest family office that made their money in healthcare. Everybody knows their name, okay? And the guy said to me, he said, Steve, you know, 80% of my money, I just wanna beat taxes, beat interest rates and get a little cherry on top. He said, 20%, I'm looking for the next Google. And <laughs> you know, so uh, it, it just yep. it, it depends. Every, you know, every family's different. Well, also, he's not a first generation person that you're talking about. He's second generation, second, second. generation, and the first generation is like I, almost touching the last turn of the century. But normally, not the challenges. Steve, no but, challenge. Uh, right. Normally, uh, when you are in the second generation, then you have an investment committee. And you have governance and the responsibility to all the family members. Depends how qual how qualified the second generation is. For instance, I have a family here in town. They're probably eight billion. Okay, um, you know, made their money in interesting ways, mostly shipping. The second generation, you know, they, the the gentleman who's running the family worked at Goldman, and um, you know, he feels he feels that his opinion is more qualified than any consultant he's going to bring in. He's probably right. I mean, he's just super sharp and he can tear through spreadsheets better than, you know, anyone I've met. So it depends on the qualification of the second generation. Well, it also now, to, now you're 800 families. Do you break them into categories and do you demand that they do uh, uh, let everyone know what they invest in and what they do not invest no. in? I, they are a silent volunteer army. And the way I look at them, listen, I may not hear from one of them for two years. Okay. But, uh, you know, I, if... I'm going to bring an opportunity, and this only works if you have a, a critical mass of family offices, okay, you where you need a small percentage to raise their hand and say, yes, I'm interested, but, uh, you know, we don't, I, I respect their privacy. So, and their, I mean, because I, I, I can understand family offices or a single family that they will go for crowdfunding, because at that point, I'm going to kind of lower their, you know, uh, uh, their place in my stack, and then... If I don't make it clear to people what I invest in and what I do not invest, 
I mean, that will inundate our right. email box. So the way I look at that, I think you're talking about is a capital stack and who else is on it, right? So that's the well, the way I just want to, the way I think I want to answer your question is the way I figure out what they're interested in is by them raising their hand and saying and showing interest. Hey, I'm interested in oncology. Yes, I'm, I want to look at this oncology transaction. You know, I want to look at this AI transaction, what have you. And that's how we categorize it. So there's, it's not just always the economic thing or the generational thing. One thing we observed, so while we work in high touch, we have fewer family offices, but there are about 16,000 family offices in Bloomberg's database overall. One of the things we see is it's also a passion thing, right? So depending on the size, someone just wants to be involved doing something. I mean, they, they, money is not the question. They just want to be in fintech for whatever reason. And so a lot of these are sometimes scope creeps. But I've seen, for the most part, there is, you know, there is some sound governance at a certain AUM level, and at slightly lower AUM levels, it's like a small hobby project. Just well, we're deviating right from Mark's question. Okay. Mark's question Thank was you. very simple: <laughs> private transactions, okay? And you're talking about duration, okay? So while I agree completely with you in terms of generations, what they want to do and what they're passionate about, yep. the private credit market's going to be transaction dictated unless you have a generational project where you're investing in a company and you want to see the life cycle of that company and it goes on and on and maybe that company has an exit and goes to something else but if i bring a private transaction whether it's a real estate transaction yeah. it's a 200 million dollar hotel in the caribbean or something like that uh there's various parts there's the development capital that comes in then you build the asset the question and i bring up hospitality specifically because of you um you now have a hotel. Do you want to keep uh, a flag managing that hotel and clip a coupon each year for the generations? Or you develop the hotel, they made a certain IRR, done. Now let's sell that hotel to a strategic or, or somebody else comes in. So the typical private credit transaction, I don't care if it's a family office or a private credit fund, is five to seven years. Yeah. Okay. Seven years is if you look at any fund, I don't care if you're Cerberus or Aries or Oak Tree or Canyon, whatever. It's a seven years. And that's the same thing for private equity. In that seven years, you made your money and you're out looking for a new exit because the fund and its LPs now are distributed the money. If the fund is extended, okay, people, the investors, the LPs don't want it extended. Then you have to look at something like in the second but, but Pete, there's a lot of platforms where you oh, sure. get but too much shorter duration. Sure. But I, I also think Marty, to his, to his point, what he's discussing there is it depends on what the family's uh, you know, are they in a control position on the asset or are they not? If they're in a control position, you can have a much longer duration with the asset uh, and, and, and your ability to uh, go on, right. Garv. Yeah, no, I, I mean, what need does it serve and what percentage of the portfolio it is? So that's kind of also what dictates. I mean, it could just be, as I mentioned, a passion project. There's no duration to it, but the five to seven years is kind of typically what I've seen if they take a portfolio call on that. We have some yeah, sure. One of the bad old things in the bad old days was the fact that there's two different talks. We're talking about stewardship. Families involved with investment policy and multiple generations. Some people talk about the deal guy they have from Goldman that is on there because oh, he's, he's the second generation part of the family. Yeah, no, I'm, I know. I'm talking about the guy that's hired into the private equity firm. It's an ex-deal guy from Goldman that happens to say, okay, I'm going to hop the family balance sheet. I'm going to get paid a better percentage right. if I'm doing deal for deal. Too many of those knuckleheads got in the business. I want to ask a question to Steve. Oh, we do have a question here. I don't want to anyway, just on, on what Steve mentioned. <laughs> Steve, John. I, I, um, oh, I know the, the, chair, I know the uh, chairwoman of um, UBS's Global Private Wealth and Family Office. She told me a statistic. The first generation comes in, they build a company, they may create their family office. Second generation comes in, 50% of the assets are gone. Third generation, it's all gone. The right in terms of that. So, right plays look at that. that. It's shaking the tree. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Listen, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, the question that I have, my experience, I worked two years for a family office and only direct investment. It would take me six months to seven months to close it because I had to source the deal, go for the first uh, the business phase, a lot of analysis, more interviews, more. It was not very different from when I worked in. Funds in private equity. I worked for uh, 16 years for private equity. Was as thorough as that. We had analysts. Then after that, we had to go to the investment committee, and then after that, had to go to the trust committee, like trust like somebody that would, you know, really say, yeah, you can make this. Then it would come down and say, yes, it's approved. Then it would make the offer, and then it would release, you know, the capital. So 
never took less than six or seven hours. It's like an so, investment committee and endowment of foundation. Same yeah, idea. so but that's that's how careful they were. And uh, now the other experience that I have had with most of the families that I know from India and for the Middle East primarily and from Europe, when you ask them about exit, they say, I buy for life. Yeah. Most of them say, I don't care if I'm going to be there for 50 years. So I when you know, when you say that your families want to live in two, three years, seven, I don't know those families. I mean, you were there from the Middle East, right? So what's the time or I don't? That's you what heard I'm me before. I mean, I am I am a patient capital long old. And there were, I said before on my panel that I there were incidents where I bought the GP out when he said he wanted to exit because that particular asset was a cash cow. Sure. Well, that's actually a pretty interesting question right there, and I'd love to touch on it. When you're diligencing a deal for a family, and you know that they're, uh, are, are you looking at, are you considering who the other investors are in the deal? Because as you just heard right there, you could have a conflict with a private equity firm, particularly if they're in a controlled position uh, to, to, to your capital and dictating when the exits happen. Nobody wants to go through a secondary and sell at a, you know, sell at a haircut on the asset, so. Well, you know, that, that's what led to the rise of SPVs, right? I mean, it was really after 2008 that people realized they're intertwined with people that have did it, uh, different liquidity time horizons and, um, you know, it can become litigious and everything, so. You know, that's really when these SPVs uh, absolutely took off. The, I think the, the terms, the way the IMAs are written, the neighborhood analysis is extremely important. Most of the deals that I have done in my prior life, but also now when I see it from the other side, helping my uh, family office clients look at the IMAs or the structures. If you're not in a control position, you better know what your role is and why you are there. So the first question is, why are you there? Uh, because, you know, oftentimes, smaller the family office, it's a tag along with somebody else. So why are we getting tag along? I think that's a... First question I make the make them ask their committee or make them ask themselves or whoever originated the deal. Uh, the second thing is if you are in a controlled position and if to the point, I mean, uh, when I, especially when I look outside of the US, there is no like two, three, five, seven years. I mean, if there's a great business and it's throwing a lot of cash, there is no time limit to anything. That's the mindset. But, uh, but you know, oftentimes you really need to, even in a controlled position, think about, you know, value creation, value markers and, and things of that nature. So, how do you enshrine all of that? How do you measure it? How do you communicate it? There's a quid pro quo to that. If you are a smaller family office in a larger transaction, and it's dominated by another family office that is the control position, okay? Um, you tag along on the hopes that they have the expertise. But if something goes wrong, in many cases it does, Absolutely. in that minority position, you're <laughs> dictated by the uh, what that uh, larger family office or a private equity fund is, and you might wind up with a zero. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or you're stuck for next like six Absolutely. years on extension. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the dark side of the right. right. That's the co investment right. family. So let's uh, talk about the exit. I know Marty's you know, got out his cane here. So I, I just want to, you know, take how do family offices reach the decision it's time to sell? And what's that conversation like? Uh, and obviously, you know, internally and externally, there are challenges. We're talking about the external challenges, but there are oftentimes internal challenges when you start talking about selling. That's when Peter tells me so, right, Peter? Well, no, actually, sell, by sell, that sell, time right? I got paid. <laughs> <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Bye bye. Maybe I'll take that. I think there was this whole discussion on the, the agent being brought in, right? The alignment of a CIO, whoever the person is, and, you know, how they get marked on that exit or how they get paid. I mean, understanding all of that is extremely important. But I think it can be a couple of ways. Like I think structuring therefore becomes very important. And one of the situations that we were involved in, we were able to get through to a, a listing situation where some people that wanted an exit, got an exit, but most others that wanted to, you know, just have their value marked, but wanted to be there for the real long term as a sort of 20 year path or what have you, uh, were able to, you know, stay put. So that's kind of, you know, one way of doing it. Uh, so I think structuring really, you know, matters a lot. The second thing is the role of strategics. And that's kind of where, a combination of your advisory board and your cap table comes in very handy. So if you have the right kind of partners who either have a strategic intent, so like one of the situations that uh, I've been involved with, which is a, a digital asset management company, the strategic is on the cap table as well. And they have a very different view of integrating this within their within their broader platform. And, you know, the investors here know at what price that would be. And that's the nice creative tension, but it's all, uh, you know, a creative tension with a upward bias. So I think there are many ways to get there, but I think uh, the key thing is structuring and having the focus on, 
on structuring and align the incentives of the right actors to that structure. That's kind of how I would. Peter, I mean, one Benny, interesting thing. Steve, go Sorry. right ahead. That's all right. No, uh, no, well, go right ahead. I mean, you know, sometimes you'll have a situation with internal family dynamics, right? I have a family that, um, you know, there's uh, three kids and well, they're in their mid fifties and one of the kids doesn't have kids. So they just want cash, right? So now that's putting pressure on the other family members as to, okay, you know, we, we put money into this, uh, you know, 10 year private equity fund or what have you, uh, and I want my liquidity now, what do we do about those dynamics? There should be a governance structure in place by the family. To what extent, right, that's what I would hear. Right? <laughs> what do you need governance anyway? Yeah. To what extent do you have um, domain expertise at certain family offices that are willing to share their expertise with other family offices in consideration of deal? So I see that a lot, actually. All the time. Yeah, I see it happens all the time. You're so. part of Tiger 21, right? No, I refuse you, to be a part of you, that. But you, <laughs> no, but they, I refuse to be a part of that. the club deals. That's but, right, but, because some exactly. of them get screwed on that. That's Absolutely. the idea. No, TPT but, but is much different speak, from Forge to them. We, we see a whole lot of that. We see a whole lot of that willingness to be a part of that. Actually, the delivery around it. So that's a problem. People are able to deliver their expertise because it's a tighter group of family offices. I see Marty's got out the big cane here and he's hooking us off the stage. I see Tyson Halsey <laughs> up here, Kylie Fox. So I just want to ask each one of you to do me a great big favor and then maybe one point or a theme that you would close out on here that everybody should take away with them. Um, just thank you for your time. It was a nice conversation. Come on, Steve, you can do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, Look, what I would say is uh, one of the undercurrents I'm hearing is in a recession, a lot of families have made their most money during when a recession hits, when times are hard, even if companies are going into bank or, uh, bankruptcy, that's when there's there's big opportunity. I would just segregate it by whether you have the smaller family office or a larger family office. If you have the resources, particularly when we're going into a slowdown or significant downturn, um, you can manage the investments you're doing. But if you if you don't, then you're better off staying in the public markets and for the private side, allocate it to an asset manager. Not that they're always going to be right. And many of the times, look at the uh, GFC 2008. Many of them put the gates up and you're screwed. But at least, you know, um, you're not the one that's responsible um, <laughs> giving it to oh, away to somebody else. <laughs> I think the most promising opportunity that uh, that I see is I think that there are a couple. One is uh, health tech deals. I think uh, there's a lot of orphan stuff out there in the marketplace and fintech. Fintech, especially in non-US markets, there's a lot of dead bodies. There's a lot of bad stuff. But between that, there are some interesting ideas to pick. So I think these fintech and health tech are two areas uh, which I'm most excited about. Well, this was a great, lively conversation. I want to thank our, our three uh, people up here, our, our three experts. Uh, I thought you guys were, were terrific. I love the back and forth and the banner between you, and I love the audience jumping in.